Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the second of nine lectures in Sea Alaska Heritage Institute's Northwest Coast Arts Lecture Series. My name is Jay Zeller. I am a program coordinator here at Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. This series will feature the work and journeys of Northwest Coast artists and put a spotlight on priority issues and topics concerning Northwest Coast arts. This series is part of SHI's goal to promote cross-cultural understanding. Lily Hope was born and raised in Juneau, Alaska to full-time artists. She is Klingat Indian of the Raven Moiti. Following her matrilineal line, she is of her grandmother's clan, the Duck Dainton, originating from the Snail House in Huna, Alaska. Lily learned Raven's tail weaving from her mother, Clarissa Rizal, and Kay Parker, both of Juneau. She learned Chilcat weaving from Clarissa Rizal as well, who until her passing in December 2016 was one of the last living apprentices of the late master Chilcat weaver, Jenny Flanat. Today, Lily Hope will discuss Chilcat Crisis, a calling to vitalize indigenous knowledge foundations. As you watch the lecture, we invite you to submit questions in the YouTube comments section, and at the end of the lecture, we will ask her your question. And without further ado, I would like to welcome Lily Hope. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thanks for the introduction. I've been working with the Alaska Heritage Institute for so long. It feels like we're old friends, even though you're relatively new. Um, welcome, thank you. Thanks for continuing on the greatness that is the Alaska Heritage Institute. Um, as an artist, it is wonderful to have foundations like SHI that um, support and elevate artists and the work that we're doing to continue the work of our ancestors and all that. Um, oh, I'm supposed to, uh, shucks. Stick like this. Filipino So that is my full introduction. That's how the Clinket say hi. So hey, thanks for being here, everybody. Um, my Clinket name is Wushkin Daindaat. As Jay introduced, I'm Raven Duck Daintan from the Snail House and uh, feel pretty fortunate to be a chill cat weaver, pretty much working. I work seven days a week. Sometimes it's a full admin day, but I have um, anywhere from three to five hours a day that I am doing this in my life. Welcome to this particular lecture on the chill cat crisis. And before we go into it, I just want to relate it to David R. Boxley's talk that he gave on October 1st. If you haven't watched it, go back and watch it. It's, um, it's really a, an, another call to arms. It's a, it's a calling um, for all of us really to, um, to focus on, he, he's really at the end of his lecture, he's like, yes, the art's important. The language is important. The dancing's important. And he says, um, but the potlatching and the feasting and the work that we do as a people, as cultures living in close proximity to each other, Klinkat Haida Simshian, whatever we are, um, it's our opportunity now more than ever to bring those practices back and really merge our art practice, our language practice, our dancing into that potlatching. And that's um, an extension of what I'm going to talk about or in the same realm of what I'm talking about today in that we need our village, right? It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to support artists. It takes a village to uh, retain indigenous knowledge in the way that it was passed down to us. And we can't keep doing it alone. So right now, we are in this space of, yes, the coronavirus, COVID-19, but we're in this space of um, isolation in our parenting, in our teaching of children, in our uh, learning of languages. There's less connection happening. And how do we come back to that um, in a stronger way? When we can be together again, let's return stronger than before with intentions set, with goals written down with, you know, once a week, I'm going to do this five days a week, I'm going to do this. Um, David R. Boxley is so good at 
you know, setting his, he's, he's got this language on the mind, on the heart. And he's just moving into that of like, yes, I can do the art and I can do the language. So that's where we are as the chill cat weaving world. My mother, Clarissa Rizal, uh, was one of the last teacher, one of the last students of Jenny Clanat. And the differentiation between my mother and other weavers who are still alive today, who may have studied with Jenny, was that my mother was the last one who studied a project from start to finish with Jenny Clanat. So it's, it's different to take a 10 or 20 hour class than it is to spend hundreds of hours or even you know 300 hours with a, a mentor. And the subtleties that you pick up um, in that practice of she was there all day long from nine to five. Uh, I was young, I think I was five or six years old. I remember sitting on the swing outside of um, Jenny's daughter's house and spending a lot of time waiting on the couch for my mother to finish. And I had no idea that I would be one of the people carrying on her work. And I'm not the only person carrying on my mother's work. I have to say that, that there are many, many students of my mother's, um, Shken George, uh, Ricky Tagaban, um, oh my gosh, working from the, what we don't really see her much, Jackie Kukesh, um, so many people that I can't actually name, Karen Tog goes on and on. There was a cohort of students, Nyla and Lane Reinhardt, Crystal um, Nelson. We got together in 2010 and it was kind of the first time that I got to see like how enthusiastic um, weavers are to suck up all the information that we can possibly get. Um, how to turn corners, how to make circles, how do we make that circle into an ovoid, all those things in Chilcat design. And uh, during that class, I realized that I had spent the last few years studying to be an elementary school teacher. And I was one class and one semester of student teaching away from finishing that degree. And I realized that I wasn't ever supposed to be an elementary school teacher. I was supposed to be teaching weaving. And that really was driven home when my mom passed away in December of 2016. I tried to finish that one last class uh, that following spring. And um, for some reason or another, I kept falling asleep before or during class. I missed the first three classes of that um, sessions. And I realized that like, wait, what, what is this actually? She's, she's gone and I'm more than halfway through my first chill cat blanket. What does that mean? What, what, you know, she, Clarissa talked a lot about how when she was in her final days with Jenny in the closing their six week apprenticeship, um, Jenny would nudge her and say, you're it, you know, you're it. Um, and my mom said, you know, this isn't a game of tag. I don't know what you're talking about. And then a month later, Jenny died. And my mother couldn't weave for a couple of years. And didn't understand, you know, fully understood, oh, I'm it, meaning I've got this, like you're handing this to me to be the person to walk in your shoes now. Um, and that's where I felt that in January of 2017, I was like, oh, uh, I guess I spent that time with her and um, I should probably not get an elementary school uh, degree, an elementary education, master's in teaching. So, all the studies. Um, <laughs> I'm really, really skilled at articulating why we're using this particular pedagogy. Um, <laughs> but mostly, I'm excited to continue teaching weaving. I keep saying if, if I could teach weaving like 70% and weave 30% or at least 50-50, I think I'd um, be pretty ecstatic being, uh, pretty satisfied with my life. But that's not what we're here about. We don't wanna talk about me and my work, um, except yes, kind of, because we're going back to that thing of a Chilcat weaver had the support, even just 60 years ago, we had the support of our uncles painting our pattern boards, right? They would, they would do the paint work for us. They would design and paint these for us. Um, we had our nieces and our daughters and our aunties and sisters 
um, splitting, boiling, you know, splitting, boiling, cutting, you know, uh, splitting down the bark, going out and pulling the bark off of the tree. And, uh, you know, maybe we would go with them. Maybe we would be weaving. But there was a team of our community around us to support and elevate the work. We had people who knew when to go and get the bark. Maybe they were basket weavers. We had people who would sit around and listen to the stories and split the bark into small pieces so that they would be spinnable. We had our sisters who could sit near us at the loom and learn what we're learning. And uh, you know, that time will come again when we can stop wearing masks and be together again. And we're also getting creative on Zoom and other platforms to be able to continue teaching these forms. And this is, uh, this is not light work, right? We can weave a chill cap blanket in 1500 or 2000 hours. It's not a fast art form. <laughs> and you add to that the perfect timing of harvesting our bark, pulling it off the tree, thanking the tree, you know, giving that gratitude uh, and knowing when to do that and how to pull it off the tree and how to process it afterwards. So it's not sappy when we're, when we're uh, spinning it into our wool. And then the whole thing about finding, connecting with hunters who can bring us mountain goat hides because they're not light, y'all. <laughs> if you're a mountain goat hunter and you're watching this or you know a mountain goat hunter and you're watching this, um, send them my email, <laughs> send them my way. Um, we would love to return to making our blankets out of mountain goat and uh, we need our hunters. We need our village to return, not necessarily all together. We can do this long distance, right? We could teach across Zoom and all the, the different platforms to um, share the information with people in other villages, people of other nationalities who may wish to do this to support the bigger work. What do we need? We need people who will split this bark with us and are excited about splitting it. Because you know what Chilcat weavers wanna do? Chilcat weavers wanna weave. <laughs> we do. Um, and there's so much weight on us here that we have to do this work. We have to do all the prep work. We are learning that we need to be the designers. And here's the next soapbox here, all right? I love our form line artists and that they are so driven to study the masters and driven to keep that uh, vitality of our ancient work alive and move it into this century, right? Um, retaining the mastery that was our original work, right? Either Klinkat Haider or Simshian. And I'm gonna call you form line artists to sit by us weavers at the loom. Come sit by us and watch us for a week, for a day if that's all you can handle. Um, or if you can't do that, send your designs to us and say, what is it that I need to be editing here? Because I've seen some designs in the past year that need just very minor tweaking or sometimes pretty profound tweaking that a, a form line artist puts out some work and says, here's a chill cat blanket pattern that I have made. Well, it's a beautiful design in form line, but not adapted enough to be weavable by a sane chill cat weaver, right? Not to say that, I mean, we're, we're all on the spectrum of a little bit, um, we gotta be a little bit, um, I don't wanna say off in the mind, but our minds are built a different way to want to go into this creative problem solving work of chill cat weaving that is not finished in a single day, right? So we're taking on a whole year, sometimes two years of this work. And if it makes us rip our hair out because there's no white braid to separate the colors, um, we probably will toss it to the side and work on a project that is more manageable. So in the realm 
of Chilkat Design. When you are designing, I want you to think about straight lines like this here. These are key in your design, okay? This is, this is sanity saving and um, grace saving for the weaver. Anywhere that you see a straight line coming down in a Chilkat design, this is an opportunity for the weaver to weave just this section if they want, this design field all the way down here, this straight line. That is pretty key thinking that you're gonna go into this full raven head over here because just in this space from the black line all the way to here, let's count it together. If we did this whole section right from straight line to straight line in the peak of the madness of this particular shape, we have black to the yellow, to the white, to the black, to this tiny little relief here, right? So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Oh, that relief, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That's 14 color changes across a very small space. Um, and just that, you know, inch that we have to weave all the way across there with 14 color changes is enough. That, that particular experience is enough. <laughs> we, we don't wanna add another four color changes over here. So think of our straight line in Chilkat design as the way that you can make a chill cat weaver very, very, very happy, okay? Um, what's another part? Always, always put in your double white braids, the relief lines here, see this underneath here? These little relief shapes here, the double white lines here that go in between, this is critical in, in chill cat design, all right? We're, I, I don't know where this information is lost or who's not documenting it, but somebody, I'm looking at her, needs to help do this. And Shken is also excellent at designing. Uh, my mother was particularly skilled at designing. Uh, if you want a man to give you feedback on Chilkat design, Elijah Marks is exceptional at Chilkat design. He's also a stunning bead worker. But um, yes, if you want to do Chilkat design, talk to us, send us your image and say, hey, what do you, what do you think? Where, where could I add a little bit more or take this out? Or um, also, this particular shape down here, see this little birdie guy right here with the double eyes? Don't know if you can see this. I'm gonna walk it forward just a little bit. But when you look at that guy right there, right under that eagle head, um, that particular piece has 160 moving three strand braids, right? 160 strands of braids that are going around that shape. That shape is six inches wide. Um, so, don't draw those for your weavers. <laughs> we, we don't love them. <laughs> um, and pay attention to your eyebrows. Here's another one. I want you to pay attention to how your eyebrows are shaped and how the mask of your chill cat mask comes underneath. And it's going to follow the line, if you will, of whatever that black line is under the eyebrow. There is basically the distance of two white braids between the underside of the eyebrow and that fine mask line. So little little mini tutorial in chill cat design, but that is critical, right? We, we want to maintain that space um, as our perfect white braids, because you know what that is? It's the white braid that's going around the black braid of the eyebrow. So it goes all the way underneath. And it's the white braid that's going completely across the entire face all the way to there that's closing this white shape, okay? So all of this space up here is all white. So that's really the space, that, that's all the space that we need or want to maintain the integrity of Chilkat design. Two white braids between the underside of the eyebrow and the mask of the color of that mask in the Chilkat shape. And if you can't see it, that nose is a little bit more pointed in at the crux of these nostrils, okay? So this little point right here, there's extra weavers. I should get a little pointer thing to show you, but the little, the little weaver strands actually have to come, usually when you're weaving a nose, you come all the way across and stop and then turn around and go back. 
And then that black, this black shape here of the nostril, the top of the nostril is really a straight line of black. Uh, my mother painted this one or, or designed this one and she made it. So you have to actually, the weaver has to go in and weave teeny tiny, teeny tiny stitches of whatever that mask color is. Maybe it's yellow to make a teeny tiny stitch of yellow. And then the black comes down, right? And then kind of bumps back up over this. So this is not an ideal chill cat nose. This takes some finessing for any weaver that has not woven a nose or, um, wants to take on a challenge. This is a challenge nose. So aim for that straight line. Look at the back of your weavings, all y'all Northwest Coast uh, form line designers. Look at the back of some chill cap blankets and view how they are constructed because the back of this particular weaving is straight across from the bridge of the nose to the outer edge. Like from this point all the way out to the edge here, that is a straight line usually from that fine point here all the way to there. So talk to us, talk to us, talk to us. And someone, please <laughs> give us a grant so we can study Chilcat design in depth this way and put together a book or a tutorial or a, this is how you do it. This is how you don't wanna do it. This drives your weavers crazy. This makes your weavers so happy. Wouldn't that be a fun book? So I think that's, that's on the horizon that we need to be um, going back to that conversation and saying, huh, you think that works? You think somebody would want to weave it? I'm going to show you another example. This one also comes from my mother who left me all of the scraps. Actually, this particular paper came from Preston Singletary, who was dear friends with my mother. And he doesn't remember the story of this particular weaving. Um, but if we look at this that she drew, one, all these tiny little black lines would all be braids. She never wove this one, okay? <laughs> so this, just this right here is a ton of work, all right? And then if we go down into this space, beautiful, beautiful tanaz, this yarn would have to be like lace weight or cobwebs to make a shape this big. It's like an inch and a half wide. And then this for sure could be a raven's tail pattern, but these particular S shapes in here, the fire lines in here, all these flames coming up, this would make any weaver today tear her hair out. Like it would just be a little bit too nutty. And you know what I'm realizing you guys, as we're talking about this, this is a perfect lead in to, do you see what's happening right here? It looks to me that there are four fingers and a little thumb of flame right here. I have never in my life seen this before or looked at it closely that this is a five fingered hand. Look, this is not a five fingered hand. That's three fingers and a little thumb. This is, this is how we're supposed to be doing our hands in chill cat weaving. In the lineage of Jenny Clanat and Clarissa Rizal, we do not put our five fingered hand in our work, okay? This is a five fingered hand, even if it is fire, even if it's an element, not a human. And if someone ever wants to weave this pattern, I'm going to encourage you to take that fifth finger out and not weave it, even if it's fire. Why? Why do we not, why do we not use the five-fingered hand? Why? Jenny would, well, actually, Jenny nudged Clarissa about it. My mother wanted to weave a, um, a logo. It was her logo for doing uh, landscape work that she did for Alaska Corporation actually and it was a little hand holding a flower and my mother said I want to weave that hand and Jenny said no no we don't weave five-fingered hands you can edit that and it can be the two fingers up and the little you know the thumb and the other finger so I call it I affectionately call it the Berenstain Bears hand right um, and my mother said no I just want to weave my five-fingered logo why can't I why can't I and Jenny just was adamant you know five-fingered hands so my mother never got a reason out of Jenny. She got the inspiration of why, why the five-fingered hands? She said, where in history do we see the five-fingered hand? Where? Originally on the cave walls, right? Of our cavemen, they have the drawing of the caribou or the deer and the spear and the man with the spear. And then they have a handprint. 
in that nice, beautiful burnt umber, orangey, dark red, you know, that stuff printed on the wall. And what is that? What is that telling us? That handprint is saying, I was here. I was here, he was here, she was here. Look, we've got all of our hands here. We were in this space here, we humans, right? Chilcat weaving is enough of a gift that we don't need our hands printed into the work. That's our ego getting the best of us because there's no other animal, no other being on the planet who can put their hands to this and create a, a piece of work to record our history, to document our clan migrations, to elevate our clan stories, all that stuff. There's no other, the goats aren't gonna do it, the beavers, the, the blue jays, none of them are doing this work, right? And that goes for a form line and other things, but in the Chilcat tradition, we are sitting in the veil between worlds, between our physical realm and the spirit realm. And when we take our hand and stamp it into the work that we have spent thousands of hours weaving with our hands, we're making us more important than the being that this has become. We're making us more important than the recording of our history. And we're not more important we're just one in the lineage that is to come. Yep. This is the work of my mother. Uh, this was intended as one of seven child size ensembles that she was to weave for all of her living grandchildren before she passed. This one was created for my son, Louis, and in her notebooks, which there's a whole bookshelf of them that you can't see on a camera, um, in her notebooks, she had drawn seven different styles of eyebrows, if you look really closely at this, seven styles of eyebrows, and then she put little dimples in the cheeks of this little being, because when you see my boy Lewis, this is what he looks like, <laughs> with his little eyebrow and the hair is going this way and his dimpled cheeks. So, um, Grateful to my mother for this because you know what I do with it? I turn it around and study it upside down and backwards. I'm working on my third full-size chilcat blanket and this has been uh, one of the most valuable pieces that I have. That was a long tangent to design and five-fingered hands and it's all in the same realm of Let's return to this knowledge. Let's come back to the foundations of who we are as a people, as artists, as community who are making the work of uh, elevating our stories, right? Um, traditional and contemporary. That's on my list of creating works that uh, full ensembles. I'm looking for a carver who wants to make me an octopus tentacle cane, like the one that's in that one Smithsonian Museum because we need to bring our stories into full dance mode, right? Like the Git Huan dancers. Uh, yes, bring the stories to life in our regalia, continue, continue. So as interested persons, maybe you want to weave. Maybe all you really want to do is go out and harvest cedar bark. I'm gonna go out and swing in the trees with us and pull off strands of bark like this. And you really do, if you get to go out cedar bark harvesting, I got to go with Dolores Churchill in 2009. It was so fun. Um, I stayed at her house. She, I come down the stairs early in the morning and she is doing these little like elastic band exercises with her arms. And I was like, Dolores, what are you doing? And she said, oh, I'm preparing to harvest cedar bark today. We're gonna to do it today and tomorrow. So you might wanna do this too. And she's like stretching these elastic bands out, you know, standing on it and stretching her arms out, working all of these muscles here, right? I was like, ah, I'm young, I can do that, no problem. We spent five or six hours out in the forest getting strands like this of bark. Um, this may actually be a remnant from that time. Wow. 
I'm saving it forever. No, just kidding. Um, and I was so sore after that first day. The next morning we were supposed to go back out and harvest again. And I could barely lift my arms. Um, so do your ex, if, if your elder teacher tells you that you need to be doing elastic bands, you do that because I could barely move for like a week. Like I couldn't lift my arms up. Um, and it's so much work to go out and get cedar bark like this. But the fun part is when you get one this long and it's going way, way, way up the tree, um, you can actually grab onto it and swing out as if it's a rope swing, trying to get it to twist off. It's like some of the most fun I've had in decades, actually, <laughs> um, getting to pull that bark off. So yes, maybe that is what you wanna do. Maybe you want to learn how to harvest bark. Maybe you do want to weave with that cedar bark. Maybe you want to sit by us on Zoom or wherever you are or watching your Netflix, binge watching the latest series and split the bark into tiny spinnable pieces. Maybe your love is getting the mountain goat and going up into the woods and getting those pieces. We need you. We weavers, Chilcat and Ravenstail weavers, we need you and your excitement and your enthusiasm and your drive to come and learn these things with us and do these things as our sisters and aunties and nieces used to do because there aren't many weavers, y'all. If someone wanted to buy a Chilcat blanket today, whether for their clan or for a museum or as an art collector, very allowed. We've been selling Chilcat blankets for since the beginning um, for sale. Uh, if someone wants to buy one, there's about 10 of us that you can ask. Chill cat blanket. There's about 10 of us. We're, you know, we're not sitting up in some sort of like monastery somewhere and up in Nepal or wherever. We're here living and working, right? But there's not many of us who have the time and expertise to set aside a year or two of our time to weave a blanket, let alone spend the week to process our, our bark and then again spend six to eight weeks spinning all the warp we need for the work we want to make. I'm calling to you. This is my call. Return with us to our indigenous knowledge systems. Our, the foundation of who we are as a people is the little pieces like this that fit together to build our clan history. That it takes all of us together doing the splitting of the bark, doing the spinning of the wool. Oh, I didn't even talk to you about dyeing. I really, really want you to learn how to dye in the D-Y-E sense. I'm working on a book. It's called Dying to Chill Cat Weave. You love it? Isn't that the best title ever? Um, and it's the step-by-steps that we've all put together with huge credit to Northwest Coast Woolen Weaver, Kay Parker and Haida Weaver, uh, Patty Fiorella, that we are exploring pretty much nonstop, like so many times over, how to get the yellow to stay in the yarns after we use our wolf moss. We are studying what is the perfect technique for putting our copper into the ammonia how do you get this beautiful seafoam green? I won't tell you until you ask me. <laughs> um, and then this, the magic of our hemlock bark right off the tree and the dark, dark reddish brown that we can get from that. And how much exactly, how much bark and does it have to be the inner bark and the outer bark or is it just the blonde inner bark? And the intensive study that we've had to do um, pulling that information from ethnographic records from other weavers who've done it in the last 50 years and distilling it down into knowledge that we can replicate so that we can weave a mountain goat blanket uh, with six or seven hides and spun into our yellow cedar and using our naturally dyed materials but that we the weavers don't have to spend three months preparing our materials. We're calling you, 
calling you. I, I see you out there. It's you. Yes, it's you. <laughs> We're calling you to come and do this work, to rebuild the foundations, to vitalize the Chilkat weaving tradition, to allow us to continue to weave. We want to pay you so that we don't have to do this. We want to bring you buckets of berries. We want to bring you boatloads of fish. We want to pay you in green American dollars if that's what you need, because we want to weave and we want to make sure that we can make as many as many historical documents in our lifetimes. Because if we're spending three months doing this, we're not spending those three months creating the documentation of our clan histories. We're not creating the stories on record. Because, right, we talk about like the totem pole being the story, right? The story holder or, oh, I know the story of that pole. Well, some people like to say that the totem pole is a storyteller. It doesn't tell a story. It's recording that story. And you can look at the pole and say, oh, look, it's when he split that sea lion in two. I know that strongman story. You can't look at a pole and read or, you know, have the story narrated to you unless you have some of that cultural foundational knowledge. Again, vitalizing our knowledge foundations, returning to story, returning to language, returning to the potlatch, as David R. Boxley says, all of those things interconnected in the village that we need to continue doing the important work. So I think I covered all of it. Did I talk too fast for you? I'm supposed to go through, who am I? What did I do? Chillcat blankets, design. I really want you to ask me questions about Chillcat design. Really want you to do this. Do the cedar bark, shredding of cedar bark. Ask me how to get it to be so soft and not sappy. <sighs> Sit by me over my shoulder and watch me weave. If you are a designer, I will send you a Zoom link and I would love for you to see how these are con constructed because we don't get to hang out together in the village. We don't get to sit outside while you're doing your carving and someone's making food for us. Um, let's rebuild this together. Let's vitalize our communities, our knowledge foundations. I'm calling you. That's right. Okay. Thank you so much. I think I've covered all the things. So ask me all the questions. <laughs> all right, our first question today is, uh, how would you recommend form line artists to contact weavers to observe? Send us an, send us an email from our websites or a Facebook messenger and uh, say, hey, I'm interested in this thing that you're doing. Um, and, you know, um, drop a jar of fish on our door. <laughs> I don't know. Um, really, I, I, I would love for you to um, just watch me weave and understand the really intense complexity of what we're building um, that, you know, if, if you drew, if you took a Bentwood box design, like a small one, just the little like, you know, four inch by seven inch piece and transferred it over um, onto a weaving said, here, weave this. Uh, Megan O'Brien, weaver from Canada would probably be the only one who would opt to do that. Like it needs a little bit of tweaking to make it mentally manageable and technically manageable. I mean, like she is weaving, Megan has really done well in, um, carving out a niche that she is working in cobweb fine yarns, right? So my yarns are a fingering weight or a sock weight and they're, they're not horribly fine, but you know, like a baby sock or a baby hat um, thickness. And Megan O'Brien is working in like super fine, like almost hair follicle size, like um, strands of hair really in yarns. So she can spend those multiple hours, like. I don't even want to ask how many hours she spends on a four inch by seven inch piece that mimics the trigons and lines on a, on a little bit of box. Yeah. So yes, message us, email us, um, send us an Instagram message. Um, 
I Zoom twice a month already with my patrons on Patreon. If you're interested in being a patron, um, you can support my work for as little as $6 a month. I will send you four postcards a year. You can go to patreon.com slash lilyhopeweaver. Uh, if you're interested in weaving, I am offering tricks of the trade and four classes a year on that same platform. You can check it out yourself. So those are two ways. And if you are a carver, uh, I would be happy to send you the link to those Zooms when I'm weaving six hours a month um, or any other time that works for both of us. Please, please ask me about it. <laughs> and thank you for asking. My next question that I have here from the comments is how can non-Indigenous people help you in your efforts? This, we can, we can send you cedar bark, you can boil it in your crock pot, you can split it down into teeny tiny pieces um, and send it back to us or spin it. One of our, you know, uh, one of the best spinners who's been spinning pretty much since the 80s is Elena Mountford. She lives at a white, ha a white house. She lives at the lighthouse in Canada for much of the year, which means she can spin, if you guys haven't seen this, spinning on your leg. I'm going to sit up here for a second. Does this help? Let's see. So spinning on your leg, you put a, a mat on your leg and you're taking a couple strands of wool like this, okay? She's doing this from her lighthouse. She's taking a couple strands of wool. Oh, grab a couple pieces of bark. Hold on, one, two. Laying a couple strands of bark into it like this, right? And then she can drop her spinning ball, if you will, out the window of her lighthouse and spin multiple yards down, down, down the lighthouse line, okay? So I'm gonna just spin this together just a little bit so you can see what's happening. But each time that my hand is running down my leg, and I didn't even tie this onto my leg, um, each time it's going down my leg, I'm getting a single inch of weaving, not even like uh, of spinning. Like it's so tiny, the amount of the, it's so laborious. Um, but she, Elena Mountford is easily the most consistently working or spinning spinner that we have had, um, supplying Chilcat and Raven's Tail Warp to us. So look, this is the warp itself, right? with the bark in it. And of course it hasn't been back spun, so it's a little lumpy, but I spun thousands of yards of warp before I even got to weave. Um, so I kind of wanna um, bring that back in, uh, you wanna weave? Spin a thousand yards and then come talk to me, right? Just kidding, just kidding. You can totally weave with us on Patreon. Um, yes, so long answer, non-native non peoples, Spin, process mountain goat, uh, process wool, like break our wool down into little roving strips or use pencil roving, but you can totally process bark with us. That would be so fun. Yes, please. My next question also from the comments, does Chilcat weaving relay, relay a history event or clan story? It does. If you're looking at the robe that was intended to do that, yes like um, like the totem pole. So when you start researching Chilcat blankets, of course, each robe will be depicting its own story or family lineage or uh, cultural event that happened. Um, and there is the story of Chilcat weaving and how it came back to us a few hundred years ago. Um, the Haida, the Haida and the Simshian play key roles here in that we're pretty sure, and correct me if I'm wrong, y'all out here, um, it was a Simshian weaving originally that was in the care, in the hands of a Haida in Southern Southeast Alaska. A clinket from the haines Klukwan area came down to do some trade. And the way that I remember all of these little details that are kind of a meshing of three stories is that um, the clinket shows up to do some trade and the Haida says, oh, 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 well, we're having dinner. I wanna show you this really cool thing and brings out an apron woven by a Simshian person. And he says, look at this. Have you ever seen anything like this? 
And the, he wasn't intending to offer it for trade, right? The Haida was just sharing this item. And the Clinket, when he saw it, he said, oh, I have to have this. I have to, like, this has to come home with me. I'm, I'm going to have this. And the Haida was like, he's like, no, the, not an option. Sorry, not on the table for trade. And the Clinket was grumbling and saying, you know, what, what, what's it going to take for me to be able to take this home? You, you got to give me, you got to give me this thing. And uh, the Haida said, okay, fine. Um, I'll trade you for all the little red berries that you have. And the Clinket said, no, 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 no. Those ones are specific for a one trader that I still have to go see after I see you. I can't give those to you because then I'm going to have to go north and get more of them and then come all the way back down. I'm not giving you the red berries. Forget it. And the Heidi said, well, that's my, that's my option. Like, you want this thing? You got to give me the red berries. So the Clinket gave it. And he traded with the red berries and he starts paddling back to get more red berries up north in Kluckwan area. And he's grumbling to his canoe mates, right? He's grumbling to his clan members and he's like, oh, that guy, he's such a blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, negative negatives of things that you might not repeat on YouTube, okay? <laughs> Who knows if he was using profanities at this point, but he was really upset that he had to go all the way home Yes, he got the weaving, but he had to go all the way home. It carries across water, the, your voice carries across the water. So it gets back to this Haida trader and he is aware that the guy who just took his prized possession is now quite um, talking some smack, if you will. Um, so the Haida gets his war men together and overtakes the Clinket uh, trader and does some pretty graphic things to his uh, insides in a river and uh, leaves them as a flag for all Clinket people not to mess with the Haida, okay? Now, we can go back and I, I'm, I'm, I'm having a sense of humor about this, but really we don't want to talk garbage about each other, right? And that that is lasting imagery in the stories that have been passed on in that, yes, it was a Simshian weaver. Yes, the Haida overtook the Clinket, but somehow that apron still made it up into Klukwan. It went dormant for a time until a, a woman was placed into seclusion and her and her auntie or her mother started to look at this particular apron that was in their collection, found it in seclusion, right? She's in seclusion coming into uh, womanhood and they start to unravel the apron and recreate a weaving uh, based in the same techniques. So uh, I believe it was called the rainstorm robe that was created during that time uh, based on the Simshian apron. And uh, that's how it came about. So it's been a few hundred years and we didn't talk about it, but Chilcat weaving uh, is a little bit newer of a baby than Raven's tail weaving, which is the geometric form. So any time that you see like the zigzags or the squares, you know, the concentric square shape, square within a square shapes, um, that's Raven's tail. And I like to say that Raven's tail weaving the one that we have captured or the, the earliest one that's documented in a museum is older than our original president, George Washington being sworn in, okay? So we are older, <laughs> Raven's Tale is older than our government in America. And um, that's only the one that was actually preserved, right? So 10,000 years we've been around, how many hundreds of years prior to that one being in a museum have we been weaving this way? So. Long answer. <laughs> Long answers are fine. All right, my next question is, what is your take on using non-traditional colors in Chilcat weaving? Hmm. Well, this one kind of does a little bit, right? If you look closely at this, it's merging the blue and a little pop of greenish yellow in here. And I think that's as much as I would deviate from the blue and yellow we are still discovering the deeper meanings of what does that blue and what does that yellow mean? What does that seafoam green and yellow mean in relationship to who we are as a people? Um, and uh, I, I personally won't use purple in a Chilcat design or orange in a Chilcat design. 
like I said, these particular weavings and the, the teachings that were left in my care is um, more profound in a verbal sense than I can express. Um, there, is a, there is a spirituality to this that is nonverbal. Um, and I, I can't deviate from our colors for that. Um, that I don't have to understand uh, why we're doing blue and yellow or why we do or don't do five fingered hands. Um, it is my job as uh, a knowledge holder and sharer to share in the way that it was left with me and to say, we don't do this, we don't do this, we don't do this. We do do these things and we do these things with gratitude and prayer. Um, and uh, don't come to your loom angry, right? So all the things, um, yeah, no, I won't do purple. I will do purple or orange or, you know, magenta in raven's tail patterns. I love doing the zigzag lightnings in raven's tail patterns. Um, that is delightful and fun because <sighs> we lost so much of that information. We didn't have a living raven's tail teacher that could, you know, pass on the same spiritual knowledge as Jenny and Clarissa did for me and many others. My next question that um, I got outside of the YouTube comments but was asked by a watcher is, there's a lot of science and math concepts in Chilcat weaving. Do you see a need to create a space for Chilcat weaving in K to 12 classrooms? I think, I think as I was taught in the Chilcat way that I had to do all of the stirring of the dye pots, collecting of the materials, spinning of the warps themselves, um, you know, the, the brilliant science in what happens when we put the naturally colored yarns into a pot and cook it for three hours and then cook it for seven hours and then cook it for 15 hours and what that does and the magic of of human urine and this wolf moss from the Cascade Mountains, how magic that is that you can cook this wolf moss for six hours and in water and it'll still be vibrant like this. If you cook this same wolf moss, not the same ones, but you cook the wolf moss that still has color in human urine for five minutes, once it gets to temperature, this turns completely gray like devoid of all color and you have the most brilliant dye bath you could get. So the magic science behind that, yes. I think the dyeing and the color magic and the spinning of fibers and the processing of, I mean, kids are so tactile. The processing of mountain goat hair would be amazing to do with children. And they would, I don't know that they would get the like profundity of the whole thing of like, we're doing one hide together. We need six more of these to create a full blanket, but the love that they would get out of just combing all the stuff out of the hair, watching, you know, roll it up in the ash that you need and then seeing it like basically slough off of the hide after seven days, that would be enough for a K through 12. I wouldn't encourage um, teaching Chilcat weaving to children under 12, 11, 12, like I think 12, they could probably weave a circle, 11, 12, they could probably weave a circle and anybody can really weave back and forth. Like that would be fine. But the heavier stuff that comes with weaving a Chilcat blanket or weaving Chilcat, um, I don't think is appropriate for a school classroom. Good question. My next question from the comments is, have you dyed mountain goat fleece in natural dye? Is it different than wool fleece? Good question, and no, I have not. I have, I have personally not taken mountain goat and put it into a natural dye bath. It has happened in the last 50 years though. My next question is, is there one particular chill cat blanket that has been of particular importance in your development as a weaver? Good question. Um, 
it's behind me a bit. I don't know if you can see it in the corner over there, but it's similar to, actually, it's a very, very similar to this one. Hold on, I'm gonna show this back up here. Um, this one, my uncle Don actually did paint this one. It is based on my mother's robe that she wove in 2009, 2010, called Jenny Weaves an Apprentice. So this is Jenny essentially on the top. Um, with the crown here symbolized with the knowledge that she is carrying and further symbolized here with the libre or librette. Um, this is symbolic of Jenny and her knowledge. Originally, this was a hooked beak um, of eagle. So she was Jenny the eagle moiety, right, Kaguantan. And then inside here was the student um, with this used to be a raven beak here. So that was symbolic of the student of Jenny. And here you see the hand over here, right? One, two, three fingers and a little thumb symbolized here. What, what Jenny is doing is holding, like, right? Holding the space here for this learner to be in the smaller robe. So it's a robe within a robe. You can see the yellow border here goes around the whole thing. Um, so Jenny's holding the knowledge and space for this apprentice. Um, Myself and Ricky Tagaban wove on that robe with my mother, this particular pattern in 2010. And I wove a version of it now called the Heritage Robe uh, for the Portland Art Museum in 2014. Started it in 2014 and ended in 2007, 16, 15. I don't know, it was like 15 to 17. It must've been 2005, fall of 2015, uh, finished it in 2017. I can't believe that was like relatively short ago. Um, finished it about six months after my mom passed. And uh, that's a whole nother story. Someday, someday we'll talk about that. But same like my mother wasn't sure how she was gonna weave again. Uh, same for me, uh, my mom passed and I was a little bit more than halfway done with my blanket and I didn't know how I was gonna finish it. Every time I sat at my loom, I was gonna cry. And I cried a lot after she passed at my loom. Like, what do I do now? How do I do this? And um, called Ricky long distance, Ricky Tagaban. And I said, what do I do? And he said, you go to the backside of your loom, Lily, just like she taught us. Um, and you put up the ends. You take the, all the little, all the little lacy things that are little things that are sticking out and you just needle up those ends because the backside of the loom is really where they're waiting for us, right? Where our spirit beings are. Um, closest to us, right? The warp being that thin veil between worlds. So I did that for about four days. And on that fourth day, it was as if I had gone through all of my memories with my mother, um, good and bad, broken toes, screaming matches, all the good adventures, going to the Yukon territory, teaching up there in uh, Whitehorse. And all those memories like crushed through my back into the weaving itself. And I cried for 10 or 15 minutes. And then I was like, <sighs> shook it off and I was like, I can weave again. It's cool, I got this. And finished my blanket and delivered it to Portland Art Museum and the rest is history as they say. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> so uh, yes, so that particular pattern, Jenny Weaves an Apprentice that merged and morphed into the heritage robe at the Portland Art Museum, that's the one that I keep returning to. Thanks for asking. Thank you very much. Our final question today is, is there anything else you want to mention before we finish? And is there anything else you didn't have a chance to share yet that you want to mention before we go? Oh, goodness. <sighs> send me your emails, send me your messages and your questions. I'm happy to respond. It might be 6 a.m. that I respond to you. It might be 10 p.m. after my kids fall asleep. Um, if, if you are interested in weaving Chilkat or supporting this foundation of knowledge, this all the little tiny things that we need to do to keep uh, Chilkat weaving uh, a vibrant, expressive art form, um, email me, call me, message me. Thank you so much for listening. And um, yeah, thanks the Alaska Heritage Institute. Thanks for giving us time to share about these important things. Chief Lily, for sharing your story, your knowledge, and your experiences. We have several more lectures coming up during the month of October. You can find the full schedule and topics at our website, cialaskaheritage.org, on our news page. Our next one is Tuesday, October 13th, 
with Nicholas Gallinin discussing, discussing Architecture of Return Escape at noon to 1 p.m. Alaska time.